Let's see, that looks, that must be working. Welcome everybody, uh, I'm David Culler, uh, used to be a faculty member here, now emeritus, so it's uh, great to have an opportunity to come back and see some old friends and uh, meet some new faces. And I understand most of us are probably on the webcast, which is good, because there was some concern we wouldn't all fit. So. I get to take over from our colloquia chairs as the start of what we hope becomes a new tradition, which is when you invite a distinguished alumni back to speak at the colloquium, you try to pull their thesis committee together to do the introduction. So <laughs> Dave Patterson and I were going to it, it, introduce Amin Vidat together. Unfortunately, David is, Dave is sick today. Uh, so I, uh, I asked him to send me his words, so let me, whoops, wrong phone. <laughs> one Android and one Apple. Uh, one, there we go. So uh, let me start by impersonating Dave Patterson to uh, introduce Amin. He says, uh, Amin and I used to lift weights together at RSF when he was a grad student. <laughs> and. Um, I like to say that when I wrote letters of recommendation for Amin, I said he was the strongest graduate student I knew. <laughs> <laughs> this talk today shows the prescience of that observation. So we're very fortunate to have Amin Vidat speak today, and uh, the bio has the many formal accolades of his background, and like Dave, I thought I would uh, share an anecdote or two. So. Yes, a uh, graduate student of our undergraduate and graduate uh, PhD program. Um, also spent time at University of Washington, which is good because he'll be giving this talk uh, up there soon. And Tom Anderson, the third member of his committee, can introduce him at that point. So we really will accomplish our task. Uh, went up to uh, Duke as a faculty member and then UCSD. Uh, took a sabbatical at Google, oh, 14 years ago. Uh, completely rethought their network and continues to this day to lead the group responsible for everything that Google runs on. And throughout that, so we'll shift to anecdote mode, um, is perhaps the strongest supporter within Google, perhaps within the whole Silicon Valley on the importance of academic research and the hiring of PhD students coming out of these in incredible programs. He's always had a, ten a, a willingness to look beyond the usual and tackle things that were really important, even when they weren't appreciated by the processes. So if I can share two anecdotes, um, one that I uh, often reflect on when Amin was a graduate student and uh, wrote a paper called WebOS, 
which essentially laid the foundations of the modern cloud. The idea that we would have elastic computing resources available across the planet. We did not get the paper accepted the first time. The second time, or in fact, even the third time we submitted it, but finally a program chair decided to invite the paper uh, because it was so important and went on to win test of time awards and, and so forth. But when I was last teaching 262B, I decided on that theme to look across some of the luminaries in the field to think about we, the graduate students, would read their best rejected papers. And I discovered that Amin was way at the top of the list. His single most cited paper ever is uh, one on epidemic routing that um, never did get published. As you'll see in today, he's willing to look out beyond to see what the challenges are that are really ahead. And I think you'll be really surprised to see how much it shapes what future you all should be thinking about as you look towards your graduation. Amin, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, David, and uh, Steve, but also I, I do want to Now on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So for the for the, for the um, uh, people on uh, the stream, uh, the really what I was starting with was uh, gratitude for the department. And really, the punchline is I think that uh, the faculty, at least in the EECS, but I think across the campus, uh, tremendously care for the students. In other words, I I did not come in uh, very heralded or very clueful. Uh, I, I struggled a lot, and I think it would have been easy for many faculty in many places to say, well, uh, okay, the person came in, didn't succeed, etc. But uh, not just David, Dave, Tom Anderson, uh, Eric Brewer, actually, who was a big part of uh, the effort back when I was a grad student. A lot of faith, a lot of mentoring, a lot of hours, uh, and uh, I'm ever grateful, and for me, it's really... Uh, to this day, I carry it in terms of how do I pay that forward. Uh, and so uh, thank you for having me here. Really excited to be telling you about uh, some of the work that we're doing on compute. Uh, I think it's a really, really exciting time uh, to be in compute because actually we're going to be laying the groundwork for what uh, computing is going to have to be. And so this is where this bold necessity comes in on the title over the coming uh, 20 years. Uh, le let me start with a couple of uh, housekeeping or one particular housekeeping. The um, majority of the work I'm going to be talking about here is not my own. I've had the privilege of maybe being around it and learning from it. Uh, for the subset that is my own, other people deserve uh, most of the credit. Uh, what uh, I'm privileged to do is maybe, again, extract some lessons and hopefully be able to communicate some of those to you all. It will also take a little bit of a Google-centric view. Uh, these ideas are not uh, specific to Google. I just happen to be closer to it. So please don't think that this is something special about Google relative to any other company. But hopefully, again, the illustrations and the concrete examples are useful in drawing out the lessons. Uh, so le let me start uh, with uh, perhaps a bold statement, but the work we do today will define the next generation of infrastructure and, more importantly, capabilities. Uh, if uh, we look back over what's happened in the last uh, 20 years or so, the capability that we have, I think, as a uh, uh, society and as, hum as humanity, has really actually transformed. It's been a big, big, big 20 years. And I think that actually the next 20 years are going to be even bigger if uh, the uh, trends from the last couple of years that are starting to come into fuzzy relief uh, hold out. So uh, I think an ex exciting uh, transition points. Before uh, pushing forward, uh, so I uh, look back at the last 25 years. It's been almost 25 years since I finished at uh, Berkeley. It'll be 25 years next year. Uh, a lot has changed, but I think that um, some of the big things here are that actually, if you go back to, let's say, 1997, none of these trends were obvious in 1997. Right? What we take for granted today was considered to be uh, controversial and not how anybody would go about uh, building infrastructure. So 
Over the past 25 years, we've leveraged commodity storage, computes, and network hardware, uh, organized in particular manners, but off-the-shelf, broad-based uh, infrastructure that <laughs> doubled in performance or capacity efficiency every couple of years. We leveraged commodity Ethernet and clusters of these things organized in a particular way with centralized control. And again, the rage before this sort of 25-year period was all about decentralization. The next 25 years may be back toward uh, decentralization. We'll see. But it essentially led to a re-architecture of uh, everything that uh, we think about in terms of computing, storage, databases, analytics, and networking. And it was a fundamental shift from how computing was done prior to that tightly coupled, scale-up uh, infrastructure. And what I mean by scale-up is that we built really big specialized computers, storage appliances, to take on individual tasks, specialized to those tasks. So, uh, it'll, and over these past 25 years, we've really reimagined what was possible. Right, so I, essentially, we now have real-time communication across the planet to just, uh, at this point, a shocking fraction of the world's uh, population right, and uh, quick, quickly growing. And uh, for many of us, in the palm of our hands, we have a ubiquitous real-time access to the totality of human knowledge. We, we take this for granted. I take this for granted. And 25 years ago, this was science fiction. Right? Again, just now, the question of needing an encyclopedia, needing to look up an answer, that, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, having to translate from one language to another, maybe even in uh, real time, that's, that's, uh, that was not something that was considered to be possible. Uh, and yet we're, we're living it and we're taking it for granted. So um, let me uh, start with a little bit of history and what uh, led to this uh, uh, period over the past uh, 25 years. And this is an article from May of 1991 that I remember. Uh, it was maybe the precursor of some of the research work that we did. And it was entitled Attack of the Killer Micros. So the idea back in the 90s was that you built infrastructure in a very specialized way uh, supercomputers, etc. cetera. Uh, Cray was the biggest and the best at the time. But we were starting to see hints of, and what Cray and others were worried about, was clusters of commodity PCs at the time potentially being able to take over. Not many people took it seriously, but as early as uh, 30 years ago, the trends were starting to set in of the, the last generation, the current generation, of how we did infrastructure was running out of steam. We couldn't scale things up any further. And it would take something different, perhaps these clusters of PCs, to make it happen. Uh, I was lucky enough to participate in this. Right? The Berkeley Now project, which ran from uh, 1993 to 1997, if I have the dates right, uh, took on this uh, exact problem. Now stood for networker workstations. I think you can still, if uh, you want to get a laugh of what HTML in 1994 looked like, go to now.cs.berkeley.edu. Uh, and you might uh, even uh, see this page. But the uh, ideas were bold that, uh, and, and actually um, uh, shifted over time. But the idea was that you could take commodity PCs and replace all supercomputers with it. And midway through the project, we realized that uh, there was an even bigger opportunity to deliver web services in a scale-out manner, leveraging commodity PCs. Uh, next to this is a picture of, I believe it was the 10-year uh, reunion, right about 2007, of the, the NOW team. Uh, you know, but the other thing I want to point out for the grad students in the room, uh, just fantastic friendships. I mean, I think I keep in touch with the vast majority of the folks in this uh, picture. Uh, you also see, of course, Dave Patterson there, David Culler there, uh, uh, Tom Anderson, uh, my, my advisor. So just a great group of people. Uh, never have seen uh, better varsity jackets on anybody, I would say, uh, across the board. But uh, you know, a great team and a lot of uh, work. And um, maybe right place, right time, maybe prescience, if you want to use that word. Uh, really insightful uh, faculty members, who knows. But it did lay the groundwork for how modern computing takes place, uh, one way or another, right? So now the idea of clusters, and we were lucky just one floor above us on the four, fourth floor machine room. I don't think the uh, items are there anymore. But we had 30, 40 Spark Station 1s interconnected by Miracom switches and uh, uh, interface cards on a, what was an S bus back then, and allowed us to build some really interesting things right? that, that allowed us to perform uh, Again, this sort of prediction of the future, 
on modest scale, right? But a university could afford uh, 30, 40 servers in a connected by a fast network, approximating what the future might look like across storage, across compute, across networking, right? In a way that might inspire others uh, to continue down that path. So warehouse scale computing today, right? Uh, 30 megawatts in a building, right? 30 million watts that might ho house 60,000 servers. It might house 120,000 disks. And it might have a network with all-to-all -all uniform capacity. What this means is, let's say today, each of these servers would have 100 gigabits uh, per second or more of connectivity to each of the other 60,000 servers in the same building. So you could then get the ability to communicate with uh, anyone at, at the illusion of full speed. Uh, we embrace something uh, across, again, all of industry, loose coupling and software fault tolerance. So the idea here is at this scale, 60,000 servers, something is failing all the time. And, and in some cases, entire racks are failing. In other cases, entire rows are failing. And we then push this onto the uh, developers of the infrastructure to say, OK, how do you deal with that? You deal with that. We're not going to try to build hardware that delivers 100% reliability. We don't think that that's possible. So you build your service such that it's part of the normal course of operation that things are failing uh, at scale. So we rode this wave. Capacity and performance of the warehouse doubled every two years for fixed power and cost. This is a really powerful and just incredibly powerful statement. It's simple, right? But you take that same building, you take those same commodity servers, you connect them in the same way with the latest generation of hardware. And TikTok, over 20 years, the capacity of that uh, infrastructure increases by a factor of 1,000 for the same price. Right. And no one breakthrough, lots of individual uh, advancements. And now you're talking about, hey, not just better efficiency, but radically different capability. Now you take one of these warehouses and you make a few hundred of them across the planet. And you can imagine being able to, in real time, serve up the totality of human knowledge as it's being updated. Just as one example, you can now be connected to uh, your friends, your colleagues across the planet via video. One, one of my kids asked me, what would have happened if the pandemic had happened 25 years earlier? Right? Uh, I mean, it was hard enough, awful, no question, but I think it's fair to say it would have been a lot worse 25 years ago. And what we, some of the things that and, uh, we took for granted wouldn't have been possible to do. And 1,000x buys you some of that. I'll argue that uh, more than ever, we need another 1,000x at least over the coming 20 years, but we don't know how to do that. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, over the past, let's say, 25 years, the fundamentals of how we do computing, and this is a Google-centric view. You can pick your favorite uh, systems from uh, other companies, uh, showed how to redo file systems, analytics, uh, NoSQL databases, job scheduling, uh, consistent wide area uh, database, uh, machine learning, and more, leveraging these uh, same ideas of scale out across commodity parts. But so some other interesting uh, bits here. Absolute efficiency was secondary. When you're riding a rising tide where performance is doubling every couple of years, you actually don't want to focus on getting the maximum performance out of every node, every hardware element, because actually that's somewhat wasted effort. Just keep riding the wave, and things are going to uh, rise with you. Uh, we also uh, went with centralized control. I remember uh, I was actually on the program committee when uh, the GFS paper was submitted. Some of you may know uh, this paper, SOSP 2003. And I think enough time has passed where I can share the information. We almost rejected this paper. One of the more influential papers, I think, in the community over the past 20 years. But uh, we said cent one central master that manages 20,000 disks uh, all the rage is peer-to-peer -peer systems and full decentralization. This can't possibly work. I, and it was so shocking that, and uh, radical that that actually does work, that you can build a whole building worth of uh, file storage on, again, commodity PCs with two disks in them, not some specialized hardware. Uh, if you're willing to take on the simplification of it's all going to be controlled by a single logically centralized master. And hey, within a single administrative domain, that actually makes sense. And then now push that out to many other systems, whether it's cluster scheduling, 
whether it's analytics, whether it's databases, this design pattern was uh, stamped out. Again, not just at Google, across industry. Okay, so this has been fantastic. It's been a fantastic 25 years. Uh, and now I'm going to, again, maybe say something slightly controversial, which is um, we can't keep doing things the way that we've been doing it. And so we have to reinvent. It's not, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we invented something new? Uh, that would be nice, but actually the fun bit here is we must invent something new. Uh, that's because we have new workloads. Uh, new workloads that actually are pushing the infrastructure in ways that uh, it hasn't been pushed before. Massive scale uh, machine learning and training, just uh, uh, explosion in terms of demand for the compute. Uh, coupled with real-time inference, coupled with uh, explosion in video as the uh, primary basis for uh, sensing the world and distributing content uh, as well. So wh what I like to refer to as the four S's in terms of where the workloads are winding up. Uh, societal infrastructure with commensurate requirements for reliability. Sovereignty, which now is going to then actually push on the centralized control model where we're demanding uh, placement of our data and control and ownership of our data. Sustainability, uh, many aspects to it, but uh, one of the main ones is uh, we have to not underestimate the impact that, that this infrastructure has on the environment and security. Right, so these four S's are, uh, they've always been important, but now they're coming to the fore and they're actually going to stress our existing design patterns in very, very substantial ways. So as big is the end of Moore's Law's corollaries, as I uh, like to say. So Moore's Law, uh, this notion that the number of transistors doubles every two years, has been pretty amazing. And maybe you, uh, you've heard in the literature uh, or elsewhere, Moore's Law is ended. So interestingly, it hasn't. The number of transistors per package continues to double every two years. That, phenomenal, uh, honestly. What has changed, though, are two corollaries that have actually been the thing that have powered the last uh, 20 years or so, which is the number of transistors double per package for fixed power and fixed cost. The fixed power bit ended about 20 years ago, and that led to the rise of multi-threading and multi-core architectures. Right, so actually, if we tried, for, as some of you uh, may remember, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we had two, two and a half gigahertz processors. Today we have about two and a half gigahertz processors. Yes, it's a little bit more now. But the reason that we can't go up any higher is because actually if we try to maintain uh, the, the same frequency scaling, the power density would be completely unsustainable. I'm not an expert here, but I've heard analogies that over the past 20 years it would hit the same density as a nuclear reactor today if we tried to maintain single core performance improvements at the same rate. Now, what we're hitting right now is the fixed cost bit. Uh, at this point, the number of transistors are doubling per package, but the cost is doubling too. And this, this is a massive blow. Right? You now get twice the performance out of that CPU, but you pay twice as much for it. You get twice the DRAM capacity, but you pay twice as much for it. This only becomes marginally useful. There are benefits to it, but because we're doing multi-core and parallelism anyway, the benefits are truly marginal. So we're in a world where we doubled performance at fixed cost every two years to maybe doubling every 10 years, perhaps every 15 years. And this isn't something that I'm going to warn you about happening five years from now. It's something that's already happening. We're living it uh, right this moment. And it has substantial implications in terms of how we can continue to deliver infrastructure. So then necessity, why we must reinvent, maybe the biggest one. Uh, we have to uh, scale the computing infrastructure by another 1,000x over our at most the next 20 years, hopefully sooner. But then the conventional wisdom and established architectures cannot possibly get us there. So these are obfuscated but real data. Right? So in other words, these uh, trends are uh, accurate and based on real data in terms of CPU performance, uh, DRAM cost per byte, disk cost per byte, and power efficiency. So this is over, uh, depends, but let's say over about a 10 or 15 year period. What we see is across all of these, uh, we went from exponential improvement uh, annually to flattening out. CPU performance is actually the best of the bunch. Uh, for some of these, uh, disk, DRAM, and more, we're actually seeing increases. Right, so as we're doubling the uh, capacity, let's say, we're more than doubling the cost. 
And this has, again, implications for what uh, we do for infrastructure. OK, so that's the path here, um, a path forward. That's what I'll be talking about uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, we've worked with scale out, but the underlying efficiency improvements that enabled scale out to work uh, has ended. So we have to do some things differently. And so here are four implications in terms of, uh, of course, I'm not going to give you the answers. I don't know them. Uh, but I think that they're going to be driven by these four implications. One is specialized hardware finally makes sense. It hadn't made sense for the past 20 years. We're starting to see it make sense now. The programming model is more important than ever. We're still working 20 years later to digest the implications of multi-threading and multi-core. I don't think we as a community have that figured out. Now we get to figure out how to program to specialized hardware. And I don't think that actually that's getting nearly enough attention. The slope of the scalability curve finally matters. In other words, previously, as long as you scaled linearly to 50,000, you didn't care. Now, scaling down to a single server matters, and how much you get out of each server or each hardware component or each disk or each SSD matters. So the efficiency of that uh, scalability curve, uh, th there's a lot there, and a lot left being left on the table. And finally, while we've settled into our somewhat comfortable layers, we're going to have to bust across those layers, in particular working across software and hardware to drive not component-level efficiency improvements, but systems-level efficiency improvements. And we're going to measure our success not in terms of how do I improve the uh, uh, performance of my CPU or the capacity of my DRAM, but how I make my workload exponentially faster to run given a system architecture. This, I mean, a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of challenge and a lot of difference relative to how we've done things. So I'm going to illustrate these uh, opportunities and these implications through three vignettes, uh, different systems and different pieces of work that uh, uh, I've uh, had the privilege of seeing and that uh, we've been a part of at uh, Google. So the first one is uh, TPU supercomputing, uh, or why judicious specialization matters. So I think uh, Dave actually, Patterson, uh, presented uh, some of this at uh, one of the first uh, colloquiums for th this uh, semester. So I can go uh, somewhat quickly here. But uh, the observation from about five years ago at Google was, what if every one of Google's users started interacting with, uh, let's say, search or computing for three minutes a day via voice? Which was not a crazy question to be asking, and uh, possi quite possible, likely, and maybe even more. But so this would be the baseline. And the answer to that was, we'd have to build 10x infrastructure or something like that uh, relative to everything that we'd ever built before. In other words, given how we were doing things, and we in our ultimate hubris thought we were doing things pretty well, we couldn't afford to support this use case. We couldn't afford to have our users interact with our services via voice for three minutes a day. So that's not something that we could have uh, supported or imagined or gone after. Uh, so the team said, well, what if we were able to make um, voice recognition 10x, 100x perhaps more efficient. And that's what launched the TPU effort. So uh, there's uh, papers on uh, these uh, systems, but essentially specialization of, for a particular application that requires a huge amount of uh, cycles. Right? Oftentimes uh, matrix multiplication operations, but increasingly different kinds of operations. Uh, pictures are probably a little bit hard to see, but these are uh, very large-scale systems, highly tightly coupled. So one of the things I want to bring out for you is that they break all the mold of how we did cluster uh, systems previously. There are, in our latest generation uh, systems, 4,096 uh, ASICs, individual TPU ASICs, each one of them liquid-cooled, each one of them huge computing power compared to any CPU, with a custom network that essentially drops uh, parameters into the right location of high bandwidth memory across the 4,096 nodes at the exact right moment, right, predetermined uh, at microsecond, sub-microsecond granularity. Right? The sort of tight coupling among 4,096 ASICs connected by a particular topology, not running on Ethernet. So remember, I was saying things like commodity Ethernet. This is not running IP. This is not running TCP. This is not running RPC. It is running a very, very low-level protocol designed to drop numbers into the right locations, predetermined locations by a compiler in uh, remote ASICs to run a higher level computation. And we could not have achieved the level of scale or efficiency or speed up if we were 
uh, following conventional wisdom for how you would build such a, a piece of infrastructure. The conventional wisdom for the past 20 years. Now some of you may be saying, well, yeah, of course, but what about the 20 years before that? Okay, agreed, but the point is that things have now shifted, right? What worked, f uh, what, how we went about things uh, for the past 20 years have stopped working. Okay, so uh, I, I covered some of this. T judicious speci specialization plus application code design. Uh, specialized hardware for dense matrix multiplication. We moved from DRAM to stacked high bandwidth memory. So in other words, we actually put on package uh, a smaller amount, let's say closer to 100 gigabytes than a terabyte of uh, high bandwidth memory to keep these uh, floating point operations uh, fed uh, on, on the TPUs. Uh, more recently, we have specialized hardware for scatter-gather operations as things have become more irregular. We have this synchronous point-to-point super high bandwidth uh, interconnect designed to distribute parameters across the system. Uh, everything is liquid cooled, uh, which is again something that none of our data centers uh, did previously. Uh, everything was air cooled to get the maximum uh, performance and efficiency out. And we even considered uh, specialized uh, data representations, uh, INT4, uh, BF16, and uh, lots of innovation happening here. Uh, and this is not even talking about the app application model level co-design that uh, has gone on. So taken together, these things have delivered at least a factor 10, perhaps closer to a factor of 100x system efficiency. What this means is the performance, the power, and the cost relative to trying to do similar things on uh, general purpose hardware is th that much more efficient for the same price. Now, again, w once you deliver these 100x's, uh, the thing, again, that excites me the most is not, hey, I made my thing 100x more efficient. That's pretty awesome. But now you can imagine doing things that uh, previously were considered unimaginable. So I'm going to give one uh, quick example here, which is Palm. Uh, and this is uh, a large language model that was trained at Google, a 540 billion uh, parameter model. Uh, at the time, and I think still, uh, it's hard to keep up. It's always changing. But certainly at the time, it was the largest uh, uh, model uh, trained. It ran for six weeks uh, continuously, nonstop, on 6,144 chips across two of these uh, TPU pods. I mentioned there were 4,096 uh, of these. Uh, we ran on one and a half. This corresponded to a total of 2.56 times 10 to the 24 floating point operations. Just a, again, a stunning amount of raw computation. Uh, interestingly, it ran at 60% uh, hardware efficiency for the totality of those six weeks. So across all 6,000 chips, if there was a maximum number of possible floating point operations that you could get out of the system, and again, this is end-to-end, -end, across the network, across uh, high bandwidth memory uh, to the units, 60% efficiency. Not easily achieved is the short version, but it re reflects the co-design from the compiler to the, uh, to the model developers, to the hardware, to the network, et cetera. And uh, it's fair to say that this would not have been possible if we were uh, sort of staying within our lanes, sticking to our uh, layers, if you will, as previously uh, uh, de uh, designed. So the model itself, uh, deceptively simple. The idea would be to predict the next word that would appear from a given set of preceding words. And it was trained on a large corpus of publicly available uh, information from across the internet. Uh, I'll spend just a second on this. Uh, what this is really showing uh, is that because we ran on uh, two <coughs> TPU pods, we actually had to figure out how we would coordinate across a production data center network. So this wound up actually being a hierarchy. And the model developers had to figure out how to not have one gigantic model that run continuously over all 6,000 chips, but to partition it and to feed uh, the output of one uh, as the input to another, and then back again over the six weeks. So just designing the model, designing the compiler to deal with this, designing the networking that could manage this across the, both the um, specialized interconnect and the data center network. Uh, preparing for the six week hero run, and it was a hero run, took uh, nine months of work right, to, to really get this going. And now the amazing thing is two, three years from now, this is gonna be normal. This is what everybody does sort of every day. And then, of course, we're going to be pushing ourselves for nine months to do something that's, uh, well, if the numbers hold, 100x or 1,000x bigger. What can you get from this? Um, this relatively simple, okay, I'm going to predict the next word from a preceding set of words. If you give uh, the system a prompt like this, explain this joke, colon. Joke, colon. Did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? 
It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. The response would be, uh, seeing this preceding set of words, TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. A pod is a group of TPUs. A pod is also a group of whales. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales, but the speaker is pretending that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of TPUs. So a pretty good explanation. Uh, maybe as good as many of us could come up with. Maybe you could come up with a better, I mean, why is a joke funny? My God, you know, I, I don't know, right? It's, it's funny. But uh, here's an explanation for why this joke is funny. That's pretty reasonable. And this isn't a one-off uh, cherry-picked uh, example. Uh, the system does a remarkably good job based on a corpus of words picked from the internet and being able to predict the next word given this prompt that says explain this joke, uh, what, what the meaning of the joke is. What's the explanation for why the chicken crossed the road? I'll have to try that one, but <laughs> yeah. And maybe afterwards I'll tell you my favorite chicken crossed the road joke. Um, okay, so what else can it do? It can solve math problems and turn them into code. I'm not going to read this to you, but these are uh, you know, maybe junior high level, high school level math problems. Multi-step, three, four steps, right? And uh, maybe, uh, maybe you, like me, struggled with some of these uh, over the years. Maybe you've worked with your kids on some of these, uh, et cetera. But the point is, uh, with shocking accuracy, I, I would say, and growing accuracy, it can turn word problems into, math, into uh, code and tell you the answer. Okay, but this is, so for me, this is, uh, again, uh, so we have the totality of uh, human information in the palm of our hands today, science fiction 25 years ago. It's things like this that are giving a glimpse, a fuzzy glimpse of what the future can hold. Right? And we're not there yet, and there's a lot of problems with this, and it's not perfect, uh, but actually the capability in terms of being able to augment human creativity and to bring insight to challenging problems Right, and again, raise the level of, of uh, abstraction, if you will, of what uh, people and humans are able to work on and take for granted. It's coming into relief. I mean, it's actually, this is uh, as exciting a time as I've seen. But uh, it's going to take a radically different level of efficiency to get there. Right? And so we've seen the hints of how we can get there. But what this graph says is we've gone bigger and bigger and bigger over the past five years. So the Palm model I told you about with 540 billion parameters is just one of many that have gotten in some 10x bigger every year for the past five years. Right. That's, that's a, so we talked about doubling in performance every you know, two years. That's pretty good. But now we've got to go by a factor of 10 every year to keep up with what the community needs and they're asking for. And by the way, this is strictly constrained by what we can build. If we were to deliver 20x a year, uh, the researchers and the developers would consume that instantaneously. We at Google, and not just at Google, can't build this hardware fast enough and deploy it fast enough uh, for it to, to be used. And, it's, uh, and frankly, it's limited by affordability. So I don't think that we actually have the right architecture. Well, I think we've got a pretty good one, but I don't think we have the right final one, and I don't think anybody does. So this says breakthroughs are needed. OK, that's vignette one. Uh, vignette two is around uh, optical circuit switching uh, or redesigning for system level efficiency. So uh, one of the rules of thumb I learned as a graduate student here was uh, Amdahl's uh, second law, which said that for 1967 or so, it said for every megahertz of computation, you needed a megabit per second of I.O. Right, and we know that all I.O. today is remote I.O. Uh, so the point here is that if you start thinking about these uh, 50, 60,000 server buildings, the question is what is the right balance point that you should be designing for in terms of computation to I.O.? So doing some math, and I'll, I won't go through it uh, in detail, it's pretty simple math. If you wind up with 50,000 servers, uh, each with 128 cores going at 2.5 gigahertz, and you, can, you then need to connect them with at least the 200 gigabit per second network link. And if you want to scale to 50,000 servers, that means that you need to build a an Amdahl balanced system. You have to build a network that has 10 petabits per second of bisection connectivity. That means that the half cut across the network can support 10 petabits per second flowing in both directions. Uh, as one reference point, this is more capacity than the entire internet. 
in terms of bisection down. And we would need to put these, if you look at some of the earlier numbers, independent of machine learning. And machine learning puts this at even a completely different level. But just for quote unquote commodity compute, you'd have to put 10 petabits per second into the network to support something of this size. What we were trying to do is to get to anything anywhere, to be able to really get to these 50,000, 60,000 server um, deployments and treat them as a single computer. A single computer means uniformity. It doesn't mean hierarchy. It doesn't mean, hey, these 500 servers have really awesome connectivity, but then if you want to get to these other 500, they have terrible connectivity. So how would we uh, get to uh, building such a network? And so the net you, what you want from the network is for it to be invisible. You want it to not be a bottleneck for the computation and the storage work that the developers are trying to do. Uh, there are two parts to this. We followed uh, five generations uh, in our network leveraging CLO topologies. And since I'm leveraging history, this is 1954 telecom uh, topology uh, to interconnect the servers together in, a, uh, in our case, a five-stage topology uh, that provided huge amounts of bandwidth from commodity pieces of silicon. The bigger thing, though, that it did is actually it uh, s uh, turned upside down, taking the idea from GFS that we were talking about uh, around moving from decentralized protocols to centralized protocols uh, to a good effect. So the basic idea here is what you see on the left-hand side is, let's say you've got this hierarchical CLO topology. If you wanted to build traditional protocols around it, you would do pairwise exchange of messages among all switches, routers in the system. And they would build up through these distributed message exchanges their view of what the topology looks like and calculate how data should be forwarded across the network to provide uh, uniform connectivity across that system. This winds up having a large number of inefficiencies as I'll, I'll talk about. So the key idea that we pursued was remove uh, all of the control plane from the commodity switching hardware logically centralize it, turned out that we followed a hierarchical path, and essentially we collected information from all the switches, uh, calculated optimal solutions, and redistributed everything to the switches. So the basic idea here is on the left-hand side, you would need, for any change in the network, order log n rounds to converge, where n is the number of switches. And remember that we would wind up with 10,000 switches relatively easily in a data center network and you need order and log in messages for that same convergence. Maybe worst of all, it became impossible to achieve global consistency and correctness because everyone would be reacting in, in a non-synchronized fashion. With software defined networking, the idea was that with in order one rounds, maybe even one round, and with order n messages, maybe just two n messages, you could uh, converge and you could in fact transition the network from one consistent state to another round by round. You have a much simpler problem actually, a much more efficient problem. And now you can actually scale in ways that uh, would otherwise have been unimaginable. And what I mean by that is actually existing protocols, certainly from 10 years ago, maybe even today, wouldn't converge to 10,000 switches. They just couldn't keep up with the rate of change in the, ne in the network. Right? Uh, because something was always changing and you'd be chasing your tail reacting to the last one. Whereas these centralized schemes fundamentally could scale, and we haven't hit the scaling limits. So we applied this idea uh, across the network uh, to our wide area network as well, delivering huge amounts of connectivity between our data centers. And what, one of the things that I found super interesting, perhaps most interesting, was that it actually enabled use cases that none of us imagined in the networking team. So we built a system, and when I say we, I had nothing to do with it. The network team had nothing to do with it. The database team built a system uh, called Spanner. Uh, in the database community, it's uh, been quite famous, it, and most famous because it seems to violate the CAP theorem. It seems to deliver consistency, availability, and partition tolerance for a globally replicated wide area database. It doesn't actually, uh, and in fact, it uh, was con controversial enough where Eric Brewer, the person who invented the CAP theorem, uh, had a write-up on this. And one of the things that, again, I'm, I'm pretty proud of is it doesn't violate the CAP theorem, and it doesn't, it seems to because of the network, right? So basically, what, and you might not be able to read it, what Eric says is, first, Google runs its own private global network. Spanner is not running over the public internet. In fact, every Spanner packet flows only over Google-controlled routers and links. 
And so the, the bottom line here is that because of this, it, because of the amount of bandwidth and uh, the way that we were able to build the system, essentially partitions became nearly impossible under a range of realistic deployments such that we could envision uh, delivering a globally consistent database. Okay, so then what was the next step from here? Uh, and as we were seeing the needs of things like machine learning, our existing techniques for delivering a networking became insufficient. So this illustrating the idea of needing system level optimization, the key idea that we pursued next was actually turning electrical packet switching on its side and leveraging pure optical switching. So a lot of details to go through here, but what I'll maybe draw your attention to on the far right is what's uh, called a um, MEMS mirror, microelectrical uh, mechanical motors that can uh, control, in this particular instance, 160 individual tiny mirrors. Uh, this entire chip would easily fit in the palm of my hand. So the idea here is that rather than connecting all fibers point to point across the data center network, at uh, the scale of tens of thousands of switches, we would centralize all the fibers through hundreds of these optical circuit switches. Now these things are uh, basically a wonder because, uh, and I can't necessarily bring justice to the uh, picture here, but essentially what you can imagine is fiber connects to a, a chassis, maybe 128 uh, pieces of fiber, and the corresponding light that encodes the data is shined on this uh, uh, chip. The chip then is very precisely controlled to reflect each beam of uh, light on it from an input port precisely to an output port. Now what can you do with that? You can now create topologies on the fly. The, and in a bandwidth agnostic manner, because again, light is light, there's no processing happening here. It's input port going to output port. If it goes at 100 gigabits per second, it goes at 100 gigabits per second. If it goes at 400 gigabits per second, it goes at 400 gigabits per second. You can now get to a place where the entire topology at the bottom levels of the network can be reconfigured on the fly theoretically in milliseconds. It takes us longer than that to do it safely. But such that the topology of the computing infrastructure can match the topology of the application communication patterns. So that we're, not no, long, we're no longer building a tree, we're building a mesh, and that mesh can be matched to, let's say, uh, machine learning communications patterns. Or your storage infrastructure's communication patterns. All this says that by uh, turning conventional wisdom on its side, this by itself drove probably a factor of two in terms of cost efficiency, but most importantly, it enabled new capabilities that we might have uh, otherwise thought un unimaginable. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip this, but uh, the techniques, once again, in terms of judicious specialization, new ideas, new approaches, new architectures taken together delivered 10 to 100x improvements in network efficiency. And now you could imagine having this perhaps 10 petabit per second non-blocking 50,000 server data center network. And in turn, that enables use cases and applications that you might have otherwise thought was impossible to build. Okay, I'm gonna run out of time for vignette three, uh, which is okay. So there's a lot to do on the uh, server side uh, as well. Uh, so from, I do want to take one second though for, for me, the most important part of uh, vignette three which is actually I haven't seen enough work on and I would love to see more work on, and that is what's the right programming model for accelerators. So we talked about uh, specialized hardware making uh, a lot of sense. The problem right now is, uh, let me pick my favorite example, which is compression. Compression takes up, um, I think we're on record with this, let's say somewhere between two and 5% of all, compression and decompression, two and 5% of all Google cycles. So a substantial fraction. This should be easy to accelerate. We found it, right, well, like compression, it's not, it's not that hard if, to build specialized hardware around it. Unfortunately, people use uh, somewhere around 25 different unique compression algorithms and decompression algorithms, and the granularity of compression varies from four bytes to a megabyte. If you have an accelerator on the other side of a PCI bus that needs to operate at four byte granularity, it's probably gonna be less efficient than doing it on a general purpose CPU. And so that's the wall that we've hit, is how do we enable programmers with their existing code structures to take advantage of accelerators that don't look like things like, uh, for multiply really large matrices that are a substantial operation that might take hundreds of milliseconds perhaps, seconds or longer, that's a great thing to accelerate. 
take this thing that might take 30 nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, and accelerate that, what's the programming model? Do you take a context switch? Do you block waiting for it to complete? Now, if you block waiting for it to complete, you might as well just have done it yourself. So, and this is the simplest one, compression. How, if we are going to succeed in delivering a slew of new accelerators to the community, we have to figure out how we enable people to program to them, I would say first and foremost. Okay, so with that, um, let me end with the four S's um, again. I think all of these, societal infrastructure, secure, sustainable, and sovereignty, are technical problems, and they require new uh, systems architectures to go after. So one of the things here is, how do we break out of our traditional metrics in terms of what systems research means, and focus on ways to quantify the implications for, let's say, reliability for societal infrastructure, for security, for sustainability, and for sovereignty. Because the systems community, very proud, very uh, high impact community, uh, if, you, if you give us a number to optimize, we're going to optimize that number. And we're probably going to do it super well. But for these four things, what's my number? Right? And I have, maybe I have some vague ideas, but it's hard to know what my numbers are and what I should be optimizing. Okay, let me uh, just flash the slide. I don't know if I left enough time for questions, but I'm happy to stop and uh, let you read the thoughts on how we can collaborate across uh, industry and academia while you ask any questions that you might have. beyond the five o'clock and Jeff will explain the use of the fuzzy dice. Very easy, just talk into it. Questions? And uh, we're gonna toss the fuzzy dice for the benefit of the webcast. It doesn't quite have a Slack channel to ask questions back. So you've mentioned um, sort of building all these different systems, like going fur further up and uh, increasing integration up and down the stack. Now, one of the issues with that is that the cost of doing this uh, goes up significantly, right? Especially when you start talking about specialized hardware. Um, and as, as you mentioned, more and more uh, applications uh, demand these, you know, these new requirements. Um, how do you, uh, like, how do you uh, respond to the, uh, this rapidly increasing uh, diversity of stuff uh, to run and prevent sort of these hardware lottery-like effects where people just end up t um, tailoring their use cases because it just happens to run well on the hardware we have right now? It's a great question, and I think that um, I, I don't have a, a perfect answer, but I think you're getting at a, a lot of very important issues. So one aspect of it is um, this cross-layer optimization introduces complexity. And actually, right this moment, uh, people are not happy about it. They're screaming about it. Um, I mean, it is akin to what we were experiencing with multi-threading and multi-core. And no, no one was happy about having to optimize for that, and maybe still nobody is. But it, uh, this is why I want to highlight necessity. In other words, if we want more capability, unfortunately, we're going to have to take on the complexity. That's not a happy answer. So the happier answer, which is the second part of your question is, an important part of your question is, how do we develop the right abstractions to, appro to manage that complexity? So that it's not about the hardware lottery, to your point, but essentially, how do we abstract our specification of the compute that needs to run, and then have the runtime, probably smarter runtime than what we have available now, ex uh, extract the characteristics of the hardware, the characteristics of the com uh, computation, and then do the right mapping? But if we try to then expose all of that to the developers, will be left in very bad shape. So I, I think it's a great point. Thanks, I think we had Joe's hand as a... Thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, I found it interesting that you talked about two things I wanted to try to connect them. One is um, some of these system architecture innovations that have happened, and then also some of the uh, large language model uh, opportunities. And now, I've seen a lot of stuff on, on AI applied to systems, but I actually haven't seen it so much applied to system architectures in the way that you alluded to. Simple things like we should have a centralized master for a large fleet of machines. You could imagine would benefit from search space kind of 
uh, uh, heuristics that AI seems to be good at. Is there any work on solving the problems you're excited about using AI? Uh, there is, and I think that uh, uh, there's one, one uh, good piece of good news is that our um, the state of the art of the optimization and efficiency is uh, sufficiently low that it actually we don't need as much ML as we might get. So that's good and bad news. So there's lower hanging fruits. But I think the other side that is coming to the fore is we're actually doing things like using ML to explore what our um, hardware architecture should look like. So in the end, these accelerators are striking particular balance points. Uh, and there's an infinite number of them, infinite number of ratios in terms of compute to memory, to memory bandwidth, to networking, this and that. Uh, humans are very good at exploring this infinite space, but they're not perfect at it. So uh, now you can imagine applying ML to ML hardware design with an understanding of the models that are both here now and coming. And that's been pretty promising. You have to learn sports if you're in engineering or something. Thank you, uh, Amin. But uh, I'm really curious about the software development process for your TPU uh, supercomputer. Exactly how much time did it take to debug that program that you ran on <laughs> all those processors? I mean, the development process, what kind of language you're using? Is it Python or is it uh, C++? Uh, and also, what kind of simulation do you do for, you know, thousands of processors running, you know, different, you know, <laughs> code or the same code or, what, what, you know? There's, there's a large team uh, okay. looking at the simulation and what the different interaction between uh, models at scale uh, would be. And actually, this is an area where um, we, we absolutely could and should collaborate more uh, with academia because um, uh, the simulation infrastructure, one could argue, should be open source and something that uh, we could all be uh, contributing to. In other words, I, we certainly don't have a big enough team, very talented team, but we don't have a big enough team to be building out the simulation infrastructure to the level that we should be. Uh, we do have a large uh, compiler team and a large, uh, multiple actually, different language from uh, TensorFlow to JAX to PyTorch, et cetera, and different ones get used for different use cases and the uh, corresponding compilers for mapping them to the hardware. There's a lot of actually co-design work happening between the hardware team and the compiler team in terms of figuring out what optimizations to be prioritizing for uh, different efforts. I mean, there's a follow-up, how long did it take to actually get it running? I mean, it's uh, yeah. Good, the question was for those on the live stream. How long did it take? It's uh, we. It's hard to get the uh, long poll because so many things were happening at once. In other words, uh, were we blocked on network performance debugging across multiple pods, or were we uh, blocked on uh, code development? Certainly, months. At, when you're pushing the boundary of what's possible, uh, months would not be inaccurate. Well, the first time it was long. Yeah. So, but for the example I was uh, showing, it, it, months is, is easily imaginable. So it seems like many of the things that you're doing are also being done by NVIDIA. But uh, I'm so impressed with your presentation. It doesn't seem like there's any hope for NVIDIA to uh, catch up with you. Uh, what's the real status of that competition? <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, great, great question. Thank you. NVIDIA is an amazing company. I mean that sincerely. They're doing, I mean, what, the, what they have been doing has been uh, truly amazing. Uh, I think that uh, the, the main thing in terms of, uh, if you want differentiation, is that we have the entire stack available to us. In other words, the problem that we're solving starts at the top, which is uh, we actually are, are looking to develop these uh, large language models ourselves. So that's step one. Two, okay, now what's the specification of the model? Three, what's the compiler? Four was the runtime. Now maybe we start getting to, toward the hardware and the network and uh, things like that. We also can uh, imagine things like, you know what, we're going to make the call to liquid cool this. Uh, I'm not going to name a particular hard, hardware ASIC vendor, but it would be much harder for a hardware ASIC vendor to say this must be liquid cooled because they've now eliminated X percent of their uh, clientele who can't liquid cool their space. So we, uh, we have some disadvantages because um, I won't tell you the size of our team relative to the size of uh, some industrial teams that are working in this stuff, but we have some advantages in that we can drive things in a cross-layer manner. And given who asked the question, Eli, of course it's the optics. The optics are pretty good. Did you want one more before we close, Jeff? Anybody else? Maybe one more and sure, then closing question. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And you talk about how these models are scaling so significantly over time. Now, next scaling in the compute demands. But 
I mean, there are hardware limitations, like the sh chip shortage and things like that are going on. Um, do you think we're going to have to change our mindset from this, like, you know, scale out architecture at some point? Uh, give these headwinds? We, we have to change our uh, thinking. So sorry if that didn't come out clearly enough. With 10x uh, growth in demand a year over the past five years plus, and I think it's been uh, longer than that, there is, uh, as amazing as this community is, there's no way to keep up with that. So what that says is that some of this is going to have to come through uh, either fundamental, we're going to need some other specialization that gives us a 10x or 100x, or we're going to need to really drive different models uh, and different thinking uh, end to end. So I think we're breakthrough or two away from getting to where we need to get to. But that's okay, we have time. I mean, that we're, uh, it doesn't have to all happen at once. So maybe I'll take moderator's prerogative and try to bring this to a last question. Uh, thank you all for staying after, and I think Amin's happy to stay, have further discussion. So, Amin, if you were giving your former graduate student self advice, oh. <laughs> so what would you tell that Amin of, 25 plus years ago, still a graduate student, what would be the advice you would give to a graduate student today looking forward? Um, yeah, great, great question. I think one piece of advice is that um, research is um, more about uh, learning how to think about problems and solve ambiguous problems than it is about having an individual breakthrough. I think that the graduate student me of 25 years ago was over fixating on uh, coming up with a brilliant new idea that no one had thought of ever before and would uh, change humanity for, for the better forever. Um, maybe a good goal, but so impossible that uh, you set yourself up for heartache. At least I, I set myself up for heartache. So I think that that's um, one. Two, um, I think that the people side of uh, it is as important or, or more. Right? In other words, I think that if I uh, look back on the past 25 years, uh, it's not the individual papers um, or the individual research outcomes that I think about most, but it's the people and the collaborations that have been most uh, gratifying for me. Thank you. And with that, let's thank Amin for that.